So, okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everyone. So we already have a participant here. Uh, I'm Dr. Nur Ashikin Alias, one of a research fellow at Ungu Aziz Center, UACUM. So I have been assigned to do the opening remark for our session today. So we are very welcoming our distinguished mm -hmm. and honourable guests, Dato, Datin, Professor, Doctor, and members of the room to the eighth series of our public lecture at Unku Aziz Center. So I'm sure we will listen a very interesting topic today entitled Expanding the Frontier of Development lesson from Unku Aziz. So this presentation will be presented by our outstanding speaker who will be introduced by our moderator later. So as we all already know that the Royal Professor Unku Abdul Aziz is a very big prominent figure as an economist and academician uh, to the field of economic education and social welfare. So we hope to learn more about the Royal Professor Unku Aziz from the presentation today. So even by the name of Unku Aziz Center right now, uh, itself has been inspired by Unku Aziz uh, himself. This shown that how close related we are with the Royal Professor Unku Abdul Aziz to combat the severe poverty in Malaysia. So before we start our session for today, I would like to introduce our gorgeous and very beautiful moderator for today, Dr. Nur Hashim Hashim Lim, who is one of a senior lecturer at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, Faculty of Built Environment, University of Malaya. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, her expertise area is in community climate resilience and obesogenic environment. Uh, if I'm, I hope I spell pronounce it right. And behavioral economy. So I don't want to waste the time. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nor Hashima Hashim to lead our session for today, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ashikin. Yeah, so uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to all the participants today. Uh, welcome to today's uh, uh, sharing uh, public lecture session um, where we have the privilege of dwelling into the life and the work of an a remarkable individual, Unku Aziz. So I'm your moderator for this session and uh, I am excited uh, to have uh, our speaker for today uh, to, uh, uh, to guide you uh, through this insightful journey today. Okay, so whether you're already familiar with uh, Unku Aziz's work or are just discovering uh, his incredible journey for the first time, uh, I invite you to engage ask questions and join us in this enlightening discussion. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce to you uh, our, our uh, distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Shafiq Orhanuddin. So who is Dr. Shafiq? <laughs> so uh, he embarked on his graduate studies at the Raja Zaris Sophia Center for Advanced Studies on Islam, Science and Civilization at UTMKL back in 2011, where he earned his Master of Philosophy at the center in 2015 with the thesis uh, on today's um, uh, title, which is Unku Aziz's Conception of Development. Uh, all right, and then he continued his PhD on Fazlur Rahman's exposition on ethics in Islam, which he completed just last year in 2022. So since 2017, he is part of the academic team of a think tank under the Prime Minister's office, which is IKIM, Institute of Islamic Understanding Malaysia, serving under the Center of Economics and Social Studies. Now, his book on Unku Aziz's vision of development was launched by none other than uh, His Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah last year. Okay, so uh, let me... Um, uh, give the mic over to Dr. Shafiq so he may start his uh, sharing session with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Nur Ashikin, Dr. Uh, Hashima, for that kind introduction. Uh, as I share my slides uh, on the screen here, I would just, uh, I would just like to first of, first of all um, uh, thank uh, Nkwaziz Center for Development Studies, in particular, 
uh, its director, Professor Suhaiza, whose um, humility and um, enthusiasm on the subject, uh, on, on, of course, the work of Professor Mkwazis himself, is commendable. Uh, I, I feel that this kind of um, leadership in academia is much needed today, whereby uh, those of the younger generation, like ourselves, uh, are given the opportunity to share the little that we know that we have learned uh, from our elders in, uh, in, in knowledge, in learning, in higher education. Um, I'm aware that, uh, that there will be participants coming from various fields, as well as from various countries. And I was just informed in the chat box, there's somebody from Somalia. Uh, so welcome to, to all of our friends, regardless from where you are. I have designed the presentation in such a way that hopefully, regardless of your field, and whether you have heard of Nkwazis to begin with, you will learn something about him, who is as, uh, as our uh, esteemed moderator and and, and, and Dr. Shikin and Dr. Shima has mentioned, is a very renowned figure in Malaysia, one of the most renowned figures, if I may say so, uh, in terms of his um, reputation, academic reputation, in terms of his uh, caliber, in terms of his uh, world contributions, of course, to the nation in terms of institu institution building and development as a whole. Now, the approach that I will sort of um, bring or adopt in, in my sharing is basically how I was trained in my graduate studies. Uh, initially, I came from a, a internet business background, economics business uh, background, undergraduate degree, but then I moved to more to what I would or what they would say as a humanities uh, based uh, program as well as training uh, for my master's and PhD. And uh, so by, by humanities, I mean the subject matter of uh, religion, philosophy, ethics, history, language, civilization. And interestingly, these were also the kind of disciplines or fields of knowledge which uh, the late Roy Professor Kouazis felt very strongly about or had a deep appreciation for. And uh, in 2018, uh, this was uh, two years before Professor Kouazis passed away, his distinguished daughter, who is also a, a, a figure of renown in Malaysia as one of the most prominent central bankers of our central bank, Tan Sri Zati, did uh, say that indeed that her father wanted students of universities to recognize different disciplines, not just to focus on your own disciplines uh, at the expense of others. And, uh, and Professor Ankwazis actually explicitly stated this in one of his later writings uh, in an article titled The Role of the University in Asia in 21st Century. He said, basically he's saying, you need a cross-disciplinary approach to solve many problems that we are facing in the modern world. Uh, because, because he's aware, being a vice chancellor of a university like University of Malaya for almost 20 years, he saw that there is a tendency for academia to pigeonhole, is the term that he used, or to compartmentalize uh, problems based on your faculties or uh, field of area or specialization. Whereas the problems that we are facing out there in the world do not necessarily uh, can be addressed with particular one particular field alone. So that's why I feel that uh, this Unquasis Center for Development Studies is particularly strategic. Uh, if uh, if it continues to play a strategic role in the university in Malaysia, uh, and adopting a, 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 a more cross-disciplinary approach to our problems. So this is my approach of how I'm looking at Unko Aziz. So a lot of people may identify him as an economist, but I think as he uh, mature, as he age, and as uh, as it dawned upon him, I think he's trying to be, to be more, much more than economist. That's why his readings were very broad and his he can speak on a range of subjects. Sorry, Dr. Hashima. Feel free to interject uh, anytime. Yeah. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, most of the participants uh, have mentioned that uh, your sound is quite low. Uh, perhaps you can speak into the microphone or... <laughs> sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. My, uh... Thank you. Okay. Is it better now? Is it better? Can the participants hear better now? 
so sorry. Okay, is it better now? Okay. Testing uh, for the Tashima, is it better? Ah, Clear? yes, yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I hope I what was was it clear earlier? What I said just now at this at least on this particular slide, Doctor Ashikin. On this particular slide, it was clear. Good. Okay, so basically, it's important to approach Inquazis. Although he was trained as he was often seen as an economist, but he's much more than that, and his writings and his thoughts, his views, uh, shows this. He has commented on a range of issues about social problems, about men, uh, intellectual problems, about uh, historical problems, many problems, environmental problems. So it shows that he has the capacity and which he has developed for himself. And, uh, and, and that is what he's, uh, uh, he's espousing, and I believe he's been espousing, and he hoped to do uh, in terms of um, a development of a nation as well. Now, to have a better idea how he compares, how Professor Onkwaziz's uh, vision or thinking or uh, approach compares with the modern approach of a development. Very commonly, when you speak of development, automatically it's associated with economics. Or uh, in a more popular understanding, is basically building infrastructures. Is <laughs> So the moment you speak of development, it means expanding infrastructures such that you know there's a lesser role for the natural world, for instance. That's one, one understanding. Another understanding is economics. But economics, when, uh, also there are many ways to understand it, right? But, but, but in the, widely speaking, uh, you know, globally, when you speak of development, we look at the United Nations or you look at the main uh, top uh, economists or top speakers on development, they, they speak about, yes, economics uh, is either on the, based on the capitalist uh, assumption or it just focuses on growth, you know, economic growth. Uh, this one we hear a lot by uh, policymakers, governments. But even this growth is limited to quantitative growth. And then another dimension of how development is framed, it's, it it's only, always speaks about the material reality only. That's why it's, it's often associated with, it's very often associated with uh, infrastructure, buildings, more buildings, more uh, yeah, facilities, for instance, which is not wrong, right, uh, on its own. And then another feature of how development is understood is, is that you, you only look at either the, uh, uh, you, you look at uh, things in isolation, uh, pigeonholing, to use Mkwazi's term before in the previous slide. I mean, to say uh, you focus only on the outward uh, aspect of development, right? You focus on the in increasing economic growth, the, 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 the income levels of people, uh, elevating poverty also, also, right? But how it relates to um, questions like the environment, the questions like uh, psychological health, for instance, or environmental health, these are seen uh, separate problems. On, okay? But, okay. but Uncle Aziz, he has a different, I would say he's a different framing altogether. And as a, so what, that's why I, I, I am suggesting that he's expanding the frontiers of development from the common understanding of it. Uh, so at the outward circle, yes, he talks about uh, development in the sense of like how many economists talk uh, about it, in the sense that we need to pursue socioeconomic justice so that no one is left behind. Hence, there's this a great deal of uh, focus on alleviating poverty. We need to make sure that uh, uh, um, members of the population have uh, equal opportunities to access uh, equal opportunities and, and access to education and and um, and work and whatnot. Yes, but then Gwaziz also speaks of a another layer. Then the, he talks about uh, uh, he he's he's concerned about the cultural refinement of the people uh, in terms of you know the the the, the thinking, the character, the uh, the kind of artistic expression. He's also concerned, with, like like the kind of popular music that our youth was listening to, because for him, look, there's so much more beautiful kind of artistic expression, whether it be music, painting, and whatnot, from 
uh, you know, from the, the great civilizations of the world, including the West. But now it seems like we are too focused on the popular ones, which to, he feels is that's not really it's not really positive for the overall development of a nation. And then at the heart of it, in the center circle here, he he, he affirms he, he he's concerned or not only about the material reality that we observe that we perceive in this world, but also the spiritual or inner realities that we don't see. So pertains like when we this term Asian worldviews that I here have this slide here, it pertains to our perspective because different uh, religions and civilizations, whether it be the, the Muslims, the Chinese, the Indians, Far East, they have different perspectives about how they look at uh, this existence. And they have uh, teachings about ethics in terms of how to build a beautiful character, to build uh, you know, virtues, character traits, you know, like in Japan, they have this code of conduct, Bushido, right? And Muslim civilization, they have similar things too, you know, Futuwa, for instance. Uh, and, and, um, and the Buddhist tradition, they speak of to make sure people do not suffer in life, you know? Uh, so all, the thing, all these things, Unkwazis is well read about all these different philosophies, if you may call it, and religions. And he feels that these are very important for countries like Malaysia to develop. If we neglect this, there'll be a lot of problems in the outer, in the culture of the people, in the social life of the people, in the economic life of the people, as well as, of course, there should be another circle which talks, which deals with the environment. But that one I, have, I will mention more after this. So if you want to know his legacy as a whole, for those who are unfamiliar, is that, I mean, this is one way to classify it, maybe, the more senior uh, professors at UM, those who were acquainted with Unkwazis, maybe they have more, more sort of, or maybe they have different ways to explain Unkwazis' legacy, but this is based on mine because uh, indeed I did, I did write a book or it was based on my master thesis, which I subsequently published as a book. Um, it doesn't really come off on the, the camera. You can only see his face. Uh, okay, uh, uh, which is published by, which is published by my think tank. Uh, it can be purchased uh, at Ikim for sixty five ringgit. So, but anyway, uh, it's based on my my research, and um, so basically, they are roughly. This is how I would classify. He, of course, he contributed a great deal to the uh, higher education of Malaysians because a lot of his former students or those who studied, who took his courses and whatnot, became leading either politicians, bureaucrats, corporate players, you know, and, and one of them you have, some of them you have invited to Unko Aziz's uh, lecture series, talks like Tan Sri Sulaiman Mahbub, a former Ikim chairman and former uh, secretary of the state, Tun Ahmad Sarji, also regards himself as a student of uh, Unko Aziz. From uh, uh, even current Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, he was at UM when Kuazis was Vice Chancellor. Uh, previous Prime Minister Tan Sri Muhyiddin uh, Yassin. Uh, in fact, I I helped him. I edited his speech when he gave a tribute to Kuazis last year, uh, and uh, many figures, uh, right? Uh, 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 whose form intellectual, whose uh, educational development is thanks to the leadership or contributions of Unko Aziz. Uh, and then, of course, thanks to his research and, uh, and, and, and sort of initiatives on, in the socioeconomic uh, realm, it, I, I think to some degree it influenced the policies of Malaysia since the uh, 70s, since the time of Prime Minister Tun Abdul Razak. And then finally, another aspect of his uh, legacy, the uppermost of this pyramid, is where he's, he speaks about it, but he may not necessarily be able to sort of impact other institutions or policies, is that when he speaks about higher education, culture and vision development, the reason he, I would say he has, uh, well, he has not been received as much is because he, he only talked about this towards the end of his leadership in University of Malaya in the 80s onwards. So that's why maybe uh, some of the things I share here, even the senior professor of UM, may not necessarily recall or identify so much Unko Aziz, but in reality, it's Unko Aziz's uh, thoughts as well. 
like for example, in 1983, he actually, uh, Gorgias had an article which he presented in the UK titled, Must Patterns of Change in Developing Countries Follow the West? What Other Possible Patterns? Right? And uh, this is a most, a most striking quote to me to show that, uh, which shows us that Gorgias is not simply um, copying or understands development in a very limited or just in a Western sense, but he, he has a more... Uh, deeper meaning than that. He's saying that we are not seek, we, we change in Muslim states, like Muslim majority states like Malaysia, should not merely follow pa uh, Western patterns. Rather, it is the duty of those states to identify changes that would promote both be a better material as well as better spiritual world. A spiritual world includes you know, a, a, a better psychological, intellectual life, moral life, you know, uh, and social life when the Muslims are materially better off and are recipients of improved services, they will be able to fulfill their roles as good Muslims better. Uh, we are not seeking change for the sake of change, but rather for material and spiritual betterment. So this, this uh, quote is one of those uh, ones that really can tell you a lot about how he understands development, which is uh, not necessarily like the dominant ones that is being understood right now in the world, like the United Nations, for instance. And uh, this is uh, another statement which he wrote uh, in Malay. It, this is based on an interview he did with Majalah Nadi Insan, uh, 1979. So uh, it's it's not well documented uh, how Nkwazi's views like uh, Islamic civilization. Remember, Islamic civilization is a thousand, more than 1,000 year civilization with beautiful um, expressions of architecture and cities and designs. And, uh, you know, it's a whole approach, you know, whole system. Like this picture here is Alhambra, Muslim Spain. So Nkwazi is, is quite a big uh, fan and he's he's been digging up into this kind of history and heritage of the Muslim world. So he's saying that we should study, Mr. Dikaji. We should study what are the principles in this Islam, in this religion, as well as in the history, how it's been practiced in the golden ages, Zaman Gilang Gemilang. In, in those those in those places like in the Middle East, in Baghdad, in Samarkand, which is presently Uzbekistan, in uh in Spain, here he says, Espanol, in, in 10th century, for instance, we, we need to look at the experience, uh, then and we need to uh establish or build a model derived from this history by looking at the Muslim's history. And uh and he's saying that in, in the thoughts of the Muslims then they had a unified uh, view. You know, there's no separation between what is the state and the government. He's referring to secularism or a, a, a fragmented, you know, like a very modern way of thinking. He's saying that the Muslims in the past, they had a more complete, more comprehensive way of thinking, which is correct because this is what exactly someone like in my training who, who study civilizations, philosophies, I can see what he's talking about and he knows what he's talking about so so someone from the humanities can really say wow this is exactly what we need to be doing <laughs> you know uh, and then he he in another instance another interview uh, in 1988 he said that over the th course of thousand years from Spain to Persia Persia India of course India also had a, a rich uh, history and heritage of Muslims uh, all influences were absorbed by the Muslims. Start at Alhambra and move east through Persia into southern Russia. Look at the domes and towers in Tashkent. Tashkent is Uzbekistan today. You see a tremendous variety of styles in India, a variety, a very sophisticated Mughal civilization, Mughal referring to the Muslim period of uh, India, was able for a certain time to coexist with, with the even older culture of the Hindus. The Islamic experience as a whole has not ceased to be instructive today. So he has a, this, this perspective or this attitude in Qazis that what has happened in the past, in the last thousand years, in, especially in like what has happened in the Muslim civilization, is still relevant for us to let to, to kind of derive some kind of lesson and model and insights for our present day development thinking and models, right? And then in 1992, this is the piece of course he wrote in the newspaper. He said that 
the study of literature and mankind's heritage should not be forgotten, even though Malaysia is gearing towards becoming a scientific and progressive society in the next century. Because this is one the whole Malaysia is talking about, uh, Vision 2020, right? So he's trying to give his input in terms of how we should develop our nation. He's saying that we have examples of advanced nations where scientific achievement is balanced by an education system that encourages uh, learners to appreciate the great works of the past and present and to be familiar with at least a portion of the creative works excuse me, and discourses of mankind through, through time and across the globe. And, and this is something that he has um, uh, led by example. Right, it's very well known. Unko Aziz is so well read, uh, and according to like uh, uh, recollections, accounts of his former colleagues, like during meetings in University of Malaya with with professors with in the Senate and whatnot, he often sometimes every now and then he would quote like a a famous poet Persian poet in the middle of the meeting <laughs> to prove to explain a point, for instance, right? So it, it enriches him as a person, and that's why I think a lot of people were so impressed with him. And that's why his, you know, his intelligence is, uh, 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 is so admired by, by many because he's well read. He's exposed to the great literatures of the world, right? Even though he's by training at the basic in the basic sense, he was an economist. And then talking about um, what the university should do. This one is based on an article in uh, published in nineteen ninety four that he wrote for the United Nations. And it was published by uh, the United Nations University uh, publication. The title of this article is The Role of the University in Asia in the 21st Century. Oh, yeah, I did mention this article earlier. So he's saying that, you know, the university, it should play a very uh, specific or strategic role um, in terms of bringing in all these beautiful Asian philosophies and, and, and traditions. Uh, into the forefront of the of the education and to the students uh, awareness and students education because for for 4000 years this is what the people here are familiar and have knowledge of like in this second point so basically he's saying that because of colonization there was an interruption in terms of the how how the asian people were educated so therefore uh, when this interruption happened through colonization they were no longer familiar with the kind of wisdom that their forefathers have spoken, uh, that uh, taught or imparted, maybe only a little bit, right? But there was a great deal of wisdom, basically, uh, in the Asian philosophies, the Asian traditions, uh, people of uh, Asia of the past, right? Uh, and then this, in the second point here, he's saying that in Asia, the search has been to find ways for man to harmonize himself with nature. This one, Dr. Ashikin, would be, uh, I'm sure, would be interested in the second point. Because she's the environmentalist. In Asia, Prof. Kaji said the search has been to find ways for man to harmonize himself with nature and seek ways to inner peace by improving relations not only with this world but with the other world as well. This one, if you were to look in this article, Unko Aziz is making a comparison, a distinction with the Western uh, perspective, which is, which is to control, manipulate, and exploit nature in the name of development. Whereas Unkwazi is saying that, no, we should try to live in harmony with nature and seek ways to inner peace because this will bring inner peace. When you live in harmony with nature, you will have inner peace regardless of your religions. And Islam definitely uh, teaches this. So for him, we have for, 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 for the development model, development vision to, to be in harmony with nature again, you have to start at the university. And then gradually, of course, it will go to schools and, and lower levels of education. But universities, the perspective, the philosophy to begin with has to be rooted in the Asian tradition, Asian philosophies. So otherwise, um, the perspective will be different. The spirit or the perspective will be more towards to manipulate and to control a nature, which is a basic assumption of modern science uh, since for, for centuries. Um, the institution of higher learning, he said, okay, same article, he said, must deliberately strive to build the characters of their scholars, their academics. So it's not merely instruction, which is important, yes, but for, for centuries, uh, higher education in Asia has always been about uh, building the characters, right? 
uh, of, of, of their students as well as their scholars, their, the, the teachers, the, the, the academics. Uh, because from there, you, you produce more caring people, as, as Nkosi mentions in this quote, more courteous, more cultured people. In the, in, in the Islamic civilization and in Islam, this is why the, the term adab is, uh, is so central. Right, uh, but in the 19th, 20th centuries, the concept of secularized democratic university, according to the Western model, has encouraged designers of institution of higher learning to abandon attempts to deal with this aspect of higher education. So, so this is a very deep and profound problems which Mkwazis only was able to articulate after he's no longer the vice chancellor of the university. I think there are many reasons for that because it's a very immense and difficult, challenging problem to overcome. So I think this is one of those things that Nkwazis is talking about that I, I feel that our generation, the younger generation should try to really understand and try to, to amend or to rectify in our higher education system. Uh, in his later years also, Nkwazis, he, you know, he, 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 he became more explicit in terms of what he really loved right uh, reading right uh, so he doesn't read uh, a lot of like technical economic scientific books so much although i'm sure he did but in this article basically it was an interview uh, by a newspaper asking you know what the kind of books you, he loved to read uh, and he said that you know he, he singled out he had many uh, authors he left to read West, from western literature as well russian literatures you know Japanese poetry, very wide ranging. But in terms of the Muslim uh, civilization of Muslim literatures, he singles out, he reads Al Ghazali and Jalaluddin Rumi. These two, all, these two scholars of the past who lived like a thousand years ago, really, I mean, uh, these are <laughs> uh, uh, supremely important books for Muslim culture and civilization because they shaped basically uh, millions of people for the last thousand of years, this, this two authors, Ghazali, Arumi, so much so they remain to be read in places like Turkey, Iran, uh, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know. So in fact, some of them, I have met some of these people from these places, they memorize the poetry of Rumi. Rumi is most famous of all his poetry, right? Basically talking about uh, excellence in the in the soul, right? And talking about happiness, how you can pursue happiness and truly be happy, be contented with life, and to how to deal with this existence. Basically, these are all very important. And I think if we were to put together as a whole all of Uncle Aziz's writings, and that has been done uh, commendably by the uh, former colleagues and senior professors of University of Malaya, I think it was four volume titled "Writing for the Nation." That one. Um, it's very costly, but I think it's like, uh, you can read that uh, sort of, it's basically a collection of all the articles, almost all the articles that Mkuzi Aziz have written. So I, consult, I, I before they published that book, I had to consult the, their University of Malaya's archive to read those articles manually, like individually. I have to, I have, I have to go, go back and forth from my campus or from my home to University of Malaya library, you know, <laughs> to, to dig up everything that has been written by Mkuzi Aziz. So basically, I, I, as a whole, when I reflect and I, you know, when I really look at the range of his writings, I feel this is the, almost the totality of what he feels development ought to include, right? So in, in the, at, the, and the, at the root of it, at the core of it, at the heart of it, is this wisdom of the past that re remains relevant. Al-Ghazali, Jaladin Rumi, uh, Said Muhammad Nakib al Atas is a contemporary scholar, but he's also speaking in uh, about issues like Ghazali and Rumi uh, did, you know, and Confucius of the, of course, the, the, the great sage of the Chinese civilization, Asian philosophy as a whole. So, because what he gives all this wisdom of the past, when you talk about development, this hikmah, Bahasa Melayu, we use the term hikmah. He gives us not only a, you know, a very uh, profound and systematic uh, worldview, or I term it as a worldview, metaphysical meaning something beyond the physical reality, so much more comprehensive. But it also gives a, 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 a kind of a system of how to, to cultivate ourselves to have a more uh, substantial character, more you know, profound character, ethics. That's why I call it ethics as self-cultivation. 
and then uh and, and that will also and this quick quick wisdom, wisdom tradition also will, will contribute to the cultural refinement of the society or other and this is a proven time-tested model for centuries in uh, Asian civilization, actually. So it's a great pity that we don't give it, it's not at the forefront of our developmental agenda. And then from there, you will have a more balanced higher education where the focus is not only scientific advancement, but also human advancement. So this is why the study of humanities needs to be playing a more prominent role. In the West, they have this big debate. They are struggling. It's always a a conflict between science and humanities, you know? So, but these days, there are much more funding for the sciences, for STEM, and the humanities, they are suffering. So closing the faculties and departments of humanities in the West. But, but even then in the West, they have, like in America, they have this humanities endowment fund by the federal government of the United States. And they give hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to researchers, academics, scholars who study philosophy, history, art, you know, all these beautiful things. But we don't have anything of that in the Muslim world, to my knowledge. Uh, so there's no balance as a result. We may have scientific advancement, we may have technological advancement, but the human, psychological, cultural, uh, character level, a lot of us, we have problems. So there's no balance as a result. And, and ultimately, when you have a more bad, uh, when you have the prior two levels, ultimately, what you will see in terms of the outcome, you will see better, you can actually see this harmony between nature and culture because it has a more profound roots or, you know, compass, if you can say so. And you, you will, ne you will necessarily uh, lead to uh, greater socioeconomic justice. And most importantly, is happiness. And this happiness is not. Uh, in, in popular modern sense is often associated with like good feeling but happiness in this uh, Asian philosophical tradition is much more than that it's contentment it's tranquility of the soul it's uh, it's being at peace with yourself and with the environment and with others right so it, it, it's possible uh, you know and, and Uncle Aziz have given us the uh, the road map uh, uh, or, or the sort of the direction, the signal, signal, right? To conclude, okay. How much time have I left? left? I wasn't looking at the time. <laughs> I hope you you are not bored yet. So that's why I'm conscious of <laughs> how long uh, I speak. But if you have question after this, I can go back to the slides that I may have gone too fast. Uh, so in conclusion, if we are to really continue the legacy of God is into expand the frontiers of development as he has attempted, right? Because it's very important to expand the frontiers because otherwise this, how we understand development, development will be very limited. Uh, it, will, it will just be one-sided for instance, right? So we need to recognize that the, a lot of the problems that we face in our society, in our countries, in the world today uh, is in reality, they are interconnected. Right. Remember that 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 term pigeon holding, pigeon hole, but of course it's in the earlier on in my slides, my presentation. We mustn't see things in isolation, as if this problem of economics or society, ecology or the environment and the psychology are all separate problems. Um, right? Uh, so we should see them as uh, interconnected. There's something that is causing uh, the, the these problems, right? There, there's a there are layers. So there are certain way, certain perspectives to, uh, to see it or these problems, but if you look at the United Nations Development Goals, there are seventeen goals, right? Seventeen uh, United Nations Development Goals. They are all they are all isolated, <laughs> because this is the pattern or the trend of modern thinking. But there are very brilliant uh, Western thinkers who 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 do not think like that United Nations Development Goals, who do. Uh, who do recognize like look these are problems are actually you know it can be a, it can be understood in a more systematic uh fashion uh and you need to bring in uh you know other dimensions as well anyway okay number two we, we need to revive and develop a cross-disciplinary approach that's why i'm so happy to see that the more moderator the the, the staff at uh, academic Gwazis, a center they are so they are from different fields 
this is exactly what Umkwazi has wanted, that, that, that we have cross-disciplinary interactions and appreciation. We are, that we are talking to each other so that we can uh, address the problems together. Because in reality, the problems, we need all of our fields come together, converge, and, and to, to overcome it um, more deeply, more, you know, more substantially. Otherwise, it's, it, it will be limited, right? So we need to develop that appreciation of this cross-disciplinary approach, either whether we bring people together or we develop or train individuals who have the, this capacity, capacity within them uh, to, who have knowledge of these various fields and able to do many things in terms of addressing problems. And lastly, we need to restore the place of worldviews. Worldviews of religions, basically all religions, all civilizations, they have a certain perspective. I was alluding to it earlier. Excuse me. Uh, worldviews of religions and ethics. The one example of the worldview that I was uh, referring in earlier presentation is that the fact that in Asian, that, that this is an example, yeah? Uh, the Asian worldviews look at uh, their aim of, of, of uh, learning, of development, for instance, is so that man lives in harmony with nature and, and to, to attain inner peace with themselves and with others and the environment. But in the in a modern uh, worldview, that is not necessarily the case. The case, right? Uh, the, 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 in the modern worldview, uh, the, the focus may be more to control, manipulate, and exploit nature in the name of development, for instance. This is one example. So, but, but, so, but for us to... Uh, so therefore, the, the, the third point I have here is that we need to restore the right kind of perspective of religions and ethics in the contemporary vision of development, or you can call this the inner development. Uh, in, in Europe, there's a group of intellectuals and... Um, uh, practitioners, they have started a movement called Inner Development Goals. Basically, they, they are saying that there is a shortcoming with the Sustainable Development Goals and we need these Inner Development Goals so that the uh, the problems that we want to overcome is more complete. So this is, a, this is a group of intellectuals in Europe, right? You can look it up, Inner Development Goals. They have a website on this. Um, so this is what we need. Uh, in a time when these elements are considered obstacles or irrelevant in mainstream discourse approaches of development. So I hope that was uh, uh, worthwhile for you. I'd be more than happy to entertain questions you may have. I do apologize if I, 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 I did not uh, clarify certain things, but uh, I'm not sure who's my audience exactly, uh, you know, on, on the Zoom. So Please uh, enlighten us if you have better insights. I, I'm here to learn as well. I, I said to Dr. Hashima, I hope to learn from her insights uh, as well. So please, uh, maybe I'll pass it back to Dr. Hashima. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shafiq, for such an insightful um, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, anybody who has uh, questions, uh, they, can, they can directly ask. Uh, but about the higher education thing just now, yeah, uh, Unku Aziz, I think he founded Pasum for University Malaya. And uh, that has opened up opportunities for the local Bumiputras to study uh, medicine. Yeah, it is still a foundation course in University Malaya that is still in operation until today. Yes, so we do recognize uh, his contribution. Now, um, let me see uh, any questions. So we have three questions from Abdul Rahman. Uh, would you like to take that? So the first one is, how can, uh, maybe I just uh, uh, mentioned the questions in bulk. How can countries address the challenges of sustainable development while expanding their economies? And then the second question, what are the key drivers of inclusive development and how can they be fostered? And the third one, how can technology and digital transformation be harnessed to promote development in various sectors? I believe uh, the answers to this question is uh, really 
already in your slide, which is uh, the cross-disciplinary approach. So uh, uh, would you mind uh, elaborate on that? Yes, Thank yes. You. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer number one first. Is hmm. How can countries, because I, I believe the question is from Somalia, so maybe he hopes that, you know, the learnings here can be brought back and perhaps you can uh, expand that better in, in places like Somalia. How can countries address the challenges of sustainable development? Number one, I think the very meaning of uh, development as how I uh, attempt to uh, share here should be redefined, <laughs> right? So maybe you can use the term sustainable development, but what do you mean? <laughs> Right. So uh, like in the beginning of the slides, I, I tried to show that it should include uh, let me go back. Yeah, I mean like uh, this 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 the 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 core of it here, the wisdom tradition, most likely is absent in uh, in most mainstream uh, discourses of uh, uh, on development right even if for countries they are struggling with 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 many many pressing issues right like poverty and uh, places like who have who have been um, challenged in many ways like with wars and whatnot right uh, I, I still feel, uh, of course, you can have economists to you know to tackle the problem, to up, uh, elevate the the economy, bring investments and economic growth and whatnot. I feel that there still needs to be, in the same time, uh, individuals, advisors, or learned people who understand the this wis wisdom tradition, <laughs> you know, like properly, uh, such that they can give a more uh, a more a comprehensive meaning of economy to begin with. Like here, you, you, you throw in econo the word economies, right? But, you know, in the Muslim civilization, how they understand economy is not necessarily the same like how modern mainstream economic, uh, economy understand. We have this term, for instance, iqtisad, um, right? Um, earlier Malays they used to, to use this term uh, iktisot before they used the term economy. Iktisot it, in, it is many things. It is includes uh, you know uh, proper uh, uh, the, the art of proper livelihood and knowing priorities. What are the kind of uh, skills and know how we should focus on to fulfill communal needs? Uh, there are you know a lot of um, sort of. A, a very compelling, comprehensive economic model that is fairer and more just, right? So I think there are a lot of uh, groundworks, uh, basically, we need to do. And, 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 and I think Uncle Aziz, in some sense, is trying to point to us a very fu fundamental things that we should, we should be doing, especially at higher education. So that's why I'm particularly... Uh, encourage that the Uncozi Center of Development Studies is there, you know, being placed very strategically in, in a similar year to really look at these issues, right? Don't just take things uh, like the conventional terms and discourses at face value. We have to look deeper and look at, uh, you know, alternative models. What are the key drivers of inclusive development and count? Yeah, key drivers basically is uh, all this. Basically, the key driver is, is, is the worldview, is the ethics. Because if you don't have all this, the aim becomes deviated or becomes, you know, uh, erroneous. That's why they, there's so much eco environmental problems. Like the, this whole discourse about sustainable development goals is a bit late because <laughs> the whole model was wrong to begin with for about 100 years prior. You know, uh, that's why some some uh, policy uh, policymakers, some people who used to work in government in the West, some economists, some, they're saying we don't we, we need a systems change as well. It's not enough just to talk about sustainable development. You know, so a lot of people are becoming 
I wouldn't say radical, but they are, they are, they need they they're trying to be more introspective. Like this this one man, uh, you uh, you can look him up. I, his name is Gus. Um, I can't remember his full name, uh, but yeah, I was I just came across him recently. He used to work for the the former president of the United States, uh, several president of the United States, and um and uh and he worked for the United Nations as well, in particular with sustainable development goals. And he said, I, th I thought, uh, and he's a lawyer by training, right? I thought with good science, we could solve a lot of these problems in environment and, uh, and, and, and all these problems that the sustainable development goes. I thought for after a few decades, we can solve it because he said this. Yeah, he said this quite recently after working in the US government and the UN after 10, 20 years maybe. I thought we could solve it, but he said, and then I realized we need like a cultural and spiritual transformation to actually overcome this. So I think we have to go beyond the confines of um, common mainstream thought, you know, and think about things in a, in a more revolutionary way, if I can put it that way. Technology and digital transformation, I think secondary. I think if we get the roots right, right, this wisdom tradition right, that one will be harnessed correctly. Otherwise, I think the transformation will lead to other things. Other another set of problems will emerge. I don't think we have the proper psychological cap capacity to actually deal with digital transformation properly. Look at a lot of our young people. You know, I heard like even secondary school kids have psychological problems because they are too dependent on their gadgets. <laughs> now you want to talk about digital transformation? Okay, you, I mean, yeah, maybe uh, people these days are talking about it in the corporate sense, right? But I think there are more, there are more funda foundational uh, issues that we should consider. This is why a cross-disciplinary approach is very critical, right? When you look at this, this is just my very uh, preliminary sort of uh, uh, reflection on this. So many questions uh, here, uh, Dr. Hashima. I don't know whether people do people want to prefer to voice it out, maybe because otherwise we're just looking at this chat and just. Talking yeah, yeah, we can, box. we can. Yeah, we, we we can open it up. But I I yeah. do agree that uh, our economic development should not just be limited to using income, using money as a measurement, as a monitoring, as a categorization and motivation to be better. It should it should include a wider spectrum to include social, environment, uh, spiritual, and ethics. Right. Um. Okay, so based on uh, the uh, suggestion of Dr. Shafiq, uh, he would like to open up uh, uh, the uh, question and answer uh, to anybody who would like to uh, open their mic and ask a question perhaps. Anybody? Okay, if uh, it's okay, you can take your time to develop your question. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, but at any point in time, anybody would like to raise any questions, you need clarifications on certain things, uh, you can just turn on your mic, yeah? So in the meantime, let me continue uh, on uh, a question from Ahmad Yani. Yeah, so what stands out to uh, Ahmad Yani Ismail yeah, from, um, uh, from Unku Aziz's uh, legacy is his emphasis on multidisciplinary okay, uh, approach in solving poverty issues during those times. This approach is against the mainstream poverty elevation, uh, though the initiatives during his time is more uh, focusing uh, more on income initiatives. Um, what what mold him into thinking uh, uh, this kind of framework? Uh, do you do you think this question uh, is pretty uh, is a bit similar to the previous questions? Yeah, about the multidisciplinary, about uh, putting in other elements other than income. Yeah, to quantify uh, uh, poverty or. Um, uh, uh, no, I, I think he has an added dimension, which is what mold him into his thinking. As yeah, a framework okay. as such. Okay. Like I, answer, yes, yeah, I, I can I can address that. Yeah, very good question. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayani, yes, someone I, I know, a, a former colleague. Basically, oh. um, that's why in my book, uh, Unkozi's Vision of Development, I looked into, I tried to analyze, examine how his uh, how his thinking developed as well, right? 
and what were the possible external factors or you know uh, that contributed to his thinking number one uh, although he's, he came from a privileged family he's a prince from a royal family basically but he he lived during a time where it, there was great uh, upheaval uh, I think in his younger years he, he lived during the Japanese occupation period and uh, as a result he did not really uh, get a lot of privileges in, in fact I, I remember reading somewhere he says that he, he tries not to uh, take advantage of all those uh, royal privileges uh, and and on top of that he's uh, I think he's one of his uncle was the uh, was an influential uh, leader in Malay society that on that on Jaffa who later became the founder of Amno and uh, I have come across accounts where Ungu Aziz had interactions and discussions with Ungu Aziz. And Dato On wanted Ungu Aziz to join either the military or the uh, civil office. Ungu Aziz refused. He said he wanted to be an economist. <laughs> so he must have. Uh, and, and on top of that, I found that Dato On also, his uncle, was someone who was greatly concerned about the social economic welfare of the country back then. So that one, that is perhaps where the earlier impetus may have come in terms of his thinking about economic uh, issues, so, you know, poverty, elevation issues, rural economics and whatnot. But then in his, uh, uh, I think in his early education, I think he went to uh, a college in Singapore. I'm trying to recall the name. Uh, never mind. But in, in his college, he studied also subjects that were pertaining to the humanities, like uh, I think there were, were there was I think history or English literature. So it's not economics per se. I think this was like a diploma level. And then when he went to Japan, because in Johor then, when during the Japanese occupation, there was a, a man, a very powerful man. His name was uh, he came from the Tokugawa family a descendant of the shogun family, the samurai family. And he's in charge of trying to build some kind of a repo with the elites of the Malays in Johor. And he knew Ungu Aziz was someone very strategic, one of the big families that they should try to win over. So that's why, partly why, I suppose, Ungu Aziz was given a scholarship to study in Japan in Waseda University. This was for, for his bachelor's degree. But in Waseda, I found that uh, when he was in Japan, he, I found that uh, he, although yes, they did train him or he did, he had tutors and he had, I think he took classes on uh, like on social sciences and economics. In his spare time, he went to bookshops and, and really read on a variety of things, right? On literatures, on uh, philosophies and, and stuff. So I think he never limited himself with a particular discipline. I think that's why it made him much more very sort of uh, uh, very uh, uh, determined to address uh, problems that the people face. Because I think when you when you read these literatures, this poetry, these literatures, these philosophies, it will make you more reflective, make you more humane about mm. the the predicament of the human condition, right? So, so that's why I said we, we shouldn't see all these humanities in isolation. It's very important to really, so that this, the problems that people, the people who are facing hardship, we shouldn't see them as mere statistics. Right? Otherwise, because these days, economics are very statistical in nature. Otherwise, it's just statistics. So, but if you, if you are exposed to, to the human uh, psyche through literature, through, through philosophies and, and, and you, you understand the deep predicament that people face, then it will, I, I suppose it will guide the practical affairs of economics or politics or whatever in a more meaningful manner. So I think that's very important. And that's why I think later on, Nkwazis was able to articulate this in a more uh, academic way in the, in, the, in the articles that I shared in this presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for the insightful uh, answer. Uh, uh, can I can I ask uh, 
Uh, Dr. Shafiq, eh? I'm uh, Chang Huri, Professor Chang Huri from uh, uh, UAC now in, in New Stimulaya. Uh, I'm an economist and uh, more interested in the issue of uh, poverty, rural development, and also the economic problem of the Malays, I think, which uh, Anku Aziz uh, widely talks about in, in his uh, writings. Uh, and what, what, what are your views on... Uh, you have not touched uh, much on, on these three issues, uh, poverty, rural development, and uh, the problem of the Malays, if you can relate to your uh, overall uh, vision of uh, Gwazi's uh, views and uh, thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, indeed, I, it was partly deliberate that I don't uh, touch on those aspects uh, too much because it's quite uh, more widely known, especially among the uh, white uh, academic circles. And perhaps people like yourselves <laughs> are more uh, competent to, to think about that. But I, I of course, uh, it is something that I have studied in my uh, thesis and as well as in my book, I did touch on that. The rural economics part, the, the, the problems of Malay poverty and whatnot. And I think th uh, there's, there's one thing uh, uh, in the interest of time, I suppose, um, I would like to perhaps uh, draw the attention to on, on that. I think that, the, that whole approach perhaps is centered on his e cooperative economic framework. Mm -hmm. And this cooperative economic framework, I think, and, and I felt like Professor Jomo have uh, uh, expounded on this, is an alternative way of organizing socioeconomic life. So it's, you know, I think it's, he's trying to find a way from the uh, limitations of capitalism and trying to find alternative models, right? So I would say at the heart of it, of his uh, pursuits in uh, economics, Unkwazis, he centered on the cooperative economic vision. And this vision, interestingly, is very much aligned with the Islamic economic vision mm. And I would dare to say it's with the Asian economic vision because it's more about, it's not about uh, exploitation or profiteering, which is some of the character, uh, characteristics of capitalism, but more about common good, more about justice ultimately, so that, uh, uh, that, 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 that there is a, a lessened gap between the rich and the poor. So, but of course, it's not, uh, the challenge is, although of course, I, I, I suppose he has, he has, he has done a tremendous uh, job with Ankasa, for instance, with institutions pertaining to cooperative in Malaysia. Mm. But then I think, uh, because I think I've spoken to some colleagues who, are, who work in such initiatives at Ankasa, the problem is the mindset, you know. <laughs> How do you get people to buy in into that kind of model? So that's why, that's why again, it goes back to this worldview, this, this wisdom part. Because I think if, if people do get what is the wisdom behind a cooperative model, more people would want to be part of it. But if they are not actually exposed to the, the, the basic philosophies, the ethics of economic life, the ethics of good living, because in reality, the cooperative model will lead to happiness as well at a personal level, because it's not about, these days, it's, you know, there's too much um, emphasis on uh, 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 sort of, uh, yeah, personal self-interest, right? Uh, and and it's all about the self uh, advancement. But mm -hmm. cooperative is putting basically to put yourself in the service of mm -hmm. the society, the collective. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the brief, I think that's how I would uh, relate, Professor. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, I, okay. hope I did not <laughs> disappoint you did not, <laughs> for not touching on that. In my okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for your for your uh, question. Uh, professor is also uh, currently um, preparing for, for a book, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah. Think the question I'm, is relevant. I'm, yeah, I'm preparing a collection of papers about Nguazis, and maybe I will I will ask. Uh, Dr. Shafiq to contribute a paper after this. Yes. <laughs> Inshallah, I'd be happy thank to, to be yeah, of assistance you. in any way. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, uh, 
The next question by Muhammad Lukman. So in your opinion, do you think your our current development in Malaysia aligns with the idea of development vision proposed by Professor Unku Aziz? Because we all know that um, uh, uh, Professor Unku Aziz um, sort of have, have, have a hand in uh, uh, drawing up our national economic policy in uh, uh, yeah. trying to close the Jurang economy, the income gap of um, the northern and southern Malaysia, the urban and the rural areas, yeah, and people, the higher income and a lower income uh, uh, community in Malaysia. So do you think those are still, um, uh, the, the, that, that vision is still relevant now? Yes, uh, in, 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 in the social economic sense, I would say to some extent it has been realized. But I think because the body of work and the scope of his vision and discourse on development is so broad, I don't think enough actors in policy making and those involved with development at the state level actually able to put it into uh, reality. Right. So mm -hmm. maybe in the social economic sense, but again, that's why I in, in my presentation, I find that his scope is much more than that. How about the one in the higher education, right? I feel there's a lot of room there for those in the higher education ministry and in our universities to consider many things that he said after he became vice chancellor beyond the 80, uh, beyond the late eighties, because he finished his uh, time as vice chancellor in nineteen eighty eight. After that, after that, he continues to write many things, uh -huh. many profound things. Uh, I, I suppose he had more because he had more time because vice chancellor is very busy as uh, administration, you know, with administration matters. After that, Umkozi wrote many profound things about education, about uh, about about uh, development, right? I, so I think it's 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 not. I, I don't think it's fair for us to simply. Of course, we can criticize in many fronts, right? Uh, you know, development in Malaysia, the policymakers. Uh, the politicians, but I think that's why I feel that uh, the most strategic uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, role is uh, a host of multiple groups. You know, our first our generation, of course, with the guidance of senior professors, and and uh, also our university, right? Uh, and then hopefully from there, more people in 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 various levels in policy in government can latch on or can better appreciate. What is it that uh, the kind of development we should envision for countries like Malaysia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, another question from Nur Akma Shuhaili. Uh, were there any challenges or criticism faced by uh, Unku Aziz during his career? And uh, how did he address or respond to these challenges? I think what's what what is very honorable because you know because he 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 loves the samurai code of code of honor. So in I think I find that in many instances of challenges that he faced in his career or professional life, he dealt with it with great honor. I think I think perhaps many maybe more than many senior professors at UM maybe can share much more insights on this. But I think that's one word or one thing that comes to mind very honorable and in fact even when he's he 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 makes a mistakes or later on he can be proven that he's not entirely accurate i think he's more than happy to show to be to be corrected although he's already a royal professor a man of great standing i give you one specific example because i know this firsthand because has a younger cousin like about 10 years younger than him. His name is Professor Syed Muhammad Nakib Alatas. I think when they, in, the, in their younger days, I think maybe in the 70s, uh, they had like differences of views, about a, a host of things uh, on, on uh, if maybe the most senior professor may remember, there was at one time, because this was very passionate about talking about we need to, you know, uh, ad, advanced certain uh, an ASEAN model of cooperation or university, and then he on you know, another occasion he talked about many things lah that that were that were that the likes of Professor Alatas felt that 
there's something not quite right in terms of his articulations and his understanding. And then another instance, Prasad has found that his uh, Prasad Unko Aziz's understanding of because he was Prasad Unko Aziz is sometimes he introduces new words into the Malay vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary like minda. Minda actually is an English word, anglicized Malay word, it comes from the word mind. But Prasad, like Syed Muhammad Nakib al Atas, because he's an Islamic philosopher, he knows language, including Malay language, like like centuries before. He's saying that we already have a vocabulary that earlier Malays were using, like akal fikiran or zihin, which is a more Arabic word. Because like some, more on like this, but although this one to the masses may seem like like very simple problem, why do you want to problematize about term words and English? But these people knew there are big implications. If you don't use the right words, the society will be confused. And people will, you know, think about things in the wrong way, and that will impact actions. Uh, you know, so but although they had these differences, Professor Alatas Unko Aziz, Unko Aziz, I think in his nineties attended a ceremony, official ceremony, which was uh, which was in honor of Professor Alatas in KL. He attended not as an just as an uh, just an average participant. No VIP uh, treatment, nothing. But he goes there to honor him. Uh, partly maybe as a family member, but also as a scholar. So he doesn't, he, he has that, that humility, that honor. You, he, although he knows that Professor Atas has differences of opinions and in fact, maybe criticizes him on certain issues, but he had that great character to go there and honor the man which he feels deserves to be honored. So I think... Uh, these are exemplary things, I think. More important exemplary personal traits, I think we should try to you know because in academics, this academia these days, we don't I don't know because I have been out of academia for the last six years working in a think tank. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think we these are the things that more academics, you know, we, we younger ones especially, we should try to emulate the senior professors, you know, great character. Thank you. Right. Uh now, uh, we still have about uh, 40 minutes to go. <laughs> so We can um... finish early, uh, Dr. Hashima. I'm sure you're tired. <laughs> you know, everyone can have a nice lunch after this, early lunch. Aww. But we do <laughs> encourage uh, more questions if, if anybody uh, has, has, has any more questions. So uh, let us address uh, the last question in the chat box today. Uh, in your opinion, how is Unku Aziz remembered in Malaysia today? I think, you know, when uh, Sir Unku Aziz passed away in 2020, you saw a barrage or you know flooded with tributes and testimonies from people from all walks of life right in uh in fact i'm even the uh her majesty the queen uh came to the janaza right i think uh for those who have lived during his period including my late father my late father was a graduate of university malaya and managed to uh, I think Atan or maybe was there during Kwasi's uh, leadership at least. He's remembered as an iconic figure, you know, he's <laughs> remarkable. It's like almost uh, unparalleled in terms of, not only in terms of his academic work, but in terms of uh, the vision that he wants the, the nation at least uh, to pursue, right? And so he's not merely kowtowing to the government of the day or to the politicians. He always speaks his mind. He has this courage, this honor to speak the truth to power. And uh, and and I think uh, I remember also not only that, he even spoke to international bodies. <laughs> I think at one time, because he was involved in UNESCO, the US, the United States government was sort of interfering with something. I think he, he uh, you know, sp spoke his mind, you know, to the United States government even. <laughs> Because Unko Aziz was was a big player in the United Nations at one time. They consulted him on, on many uh, you know uh, uh, initiatives. Unko Aziz. So I think uh, so. Unko Aziz is remembered as a as that so much so that you know maybe he could be one. Uh, this this figure 
this unifying thing. You know, he unifies as many people uh, from various uh, various walks of life, right? I think partly because many leaders uh, came from University of Malaya during his period. Uh, but so much so that perhaps he could be this figure that that you know um, Malaysia promotes in the international arena, uh, among other figures. There are many great figures in Malaysia, alhamdulillah. Like, because like in China, they have they promote Confucius. They have Confucius Institutes everywhere. Uh, Germany, they have Goethe Institute because this is their famous poet, right? And they promote everywhere to learn about Je German culture, German language. Uh, Turkey, the Turkish government, they have Yunus Emre Institute, even in Malaysia, to promote uh, uh, the sort of Turkish culture, philosophies, uh, calligraphy, even. Why not? We maybe we can have Unko Aziz Institute in some parts of the world to promote our vision of development, <laughs> because it's as you can see, even some of our friends from Somalia, they're interested, they're intrigued, you know, to to learn about this. So maybe this could be Malaysia's soft power, soft uh, cultural diplomacy to offer our learnings, our insights, the, 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 you know, from figures such as Unko Aziz. It doesn't have to be limited to Unko Aziz, but Unko Aziz could be this uh, emblematic or the symbolic figure that we promote. Uh, and yeah, I think maybe that is how, uh, not only how Unko Aziz is remembered, but also perhaps how we should remember him. You know, he, he has, he, he's showing us the way to a brighter future, a more comprehensive vision of development. God knows best. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I forgot to uh, uh, mention that just now about uh, the introduction of the word mind, uh, 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 the word minda from mind, though, um, uh, as uh, to, to propagate something. Uh, a word came to mind, which is rural, because we also always, uh, when, when we talk about uh, the word rural, the things yes. that comes to mind is like a, a place that is lack of, like mm. um, uh, semua serba kekurangan, like uh, infrastructure is lacking, education, economic opportunities. Yeah, perhaps uh, uh, you can also come up with, a, with, with another word for it. <laughs> I, think, I think the word we... Malays, the learned Malays, and I think Uncle Aziz also used the term desa, I think. Not desa? Uh, sorry, not, not merely, uh, desa, D E S A. Desa, yes. Uh, not merely so, luar bandar. Because so luar bandar is like so exclusive, luar bandar, yes. as if that is because, less developed. But yeah. as you, very good point, Dr. Shima, because like the, this rural, the, funk, the place of those rural areas is supremely important for the ecological balance of the whole nation. Yes. You, you cannot have just pure urbanization. Mm. Otherwise, it's just concrete jungle, <laughs> as Dr. Ashikim was saying. There, there's no balance and people will be suffering psychologically, mentally as a result. So there should be a rural urban symbiosis, which is what I think Nkwaz is was trying to promote, you know, balance, make sure there's always balance. Uh, and, and have some respect for these people who are the farmers. Nkwaz said this, don't... Um, uh, you know, uh, undermine and disrespect people like the farmers. They are hard workers because at one time the West, they, they, they have this uh, lazy native uh, theory as if the, 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 the natives, the people, the Malays, they are la uh, lazy, lazy people, mm -hmm. uh, inherently, inherently lazy. So he said, so Nkwa just uh, responded saying, look at the farmer. He has to wake up early, you know, get ready and do many things. So that all of us, the rest of the Malaysia, can have our rice, a bowl of rice, <laughs> and be under the hot sun, and sometimes maybe during Ramadan also fasting. Uh, you know, so we have. That's why, uncle, this, yeah, this is the, about the thinking, the right perspective, uh, and then the word, choice of words is yes. very important. Yeah. Like for example, like why like um, minda akal. I mean, uh, like for example, like akal. In the in in the Islamic philosophy vocabulary, is a spiritual reality also, meaning it's not just a brain, but also there's a spiritual reality. So mm. because sometimes yeah. maybe God will guide a, a human intellect in a certain way, right? Mm. Uh, but but Unko Aziz's perspective, I think, because he's trying to deal with many modern uh, discourse on uh, the development of the mind. That's why he was friends with a very prominent 
Western uh, I think philosopher <laughs> called Edward de Bono. <laughs> but basically he, his whole concern of this is because for development of the intellect of the people. The, the, he, and I think at one time he did teach uh, something on the philosophy of mind at University of Malaya very briefly, I think. So all this, everything that he does, ultimately you can go back to how he wants us to have a, a more comprehensive understanding of development, to have you know more, more substance. Uh, one of the uh, famous uh, work of uh, Guazis was related to uh, Sarong Index. Uh, yes. This is a this is a, a, a like a, a very crude uh, measurement of uh, of uh, poverty in in the rural area where you have uh, you. Uh, every poor household uh, have uh, not more than one sarong to to wear, and then <laughs> more than yeah. one sarong you are considered to be well off. Uh, uh, you can imagine uh, the situation at that time among poverty among the uh, Malay uh, folks in the rural area. Uh, and you mentioned just now about the digital economy. This is a far very far spectrum of the modern era compared yeah. to the Saro index. <laughs> uh, so you you see any relevance uh, from the development of uh, measurement and uh, uh, index uh, from the time of uh, the work of Nguazis uh, to the present uh, uh, digital economy, for example, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big question, Professor. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the, the scholars at uh, at Unkwazi Center maybe are more well uh, equipped. Uh, but but I think one thing about that Sarong Index, uh, Prof, I think it shows how Unkwazi is very much in touch with the people in the rural areas. Yeah, very in touch, uh, and it means he's very perceptive. To have done field research, we know he's uh, done field research, going to uh, the very rural area and whatnot. Uh, mm. So and and you know so when you you, you do that it's not it's more uh, and and because and remember he was teaching this to to students many students in Malaya who came from the rural areas yeah. so when you use such uh, concepts it's much more relatable and you know it will drive people to to overcome the problems that their brethren are facing in the mm. in the kampong mm. right mm. so very important words choice of words Unkwaz is actually understood the importance of right words uh you know when, when we speak about something and this is one of the things that I, actually i try to draw our attention to mm. the right choice of words don't simply say sustainability development but uh, we don't really understand what it means uh, right yeah thank you professor yeah thank you. yeah to uh sorry to interject and to add on uh about the uh imbalance uh, development of digitalization uh mm. Certain areas, like based on uh, urban and regional planning point of view, certain areas uh, have uh, 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 physical difficulties to build certain infrastructures. And uh, that is why uh, sometimes we try to um, introduce uh, a different type of uh, economic activities for certain areas. So perhaps that is uh, something that uh, we can we can think about moving forward. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Dr. Shami, uh, yes. I have a question. So okay. when we talk about the balance, there's a balance between scientific advancement and human advancement. So previously, long time ago, we have low, low scientific and technology advancement, but uh, the human have a good attitude, uh, always have the effort to moving forward. But right now we have a high technology, high scientific, but our human advancement, our human characteristic itself, well, we kind of have like a social problem because we have high technology, but we kind of like isolated from the community, from the human. So we can see that uh, from the Profess, uh, from the uh, view of uh, Uncle Aziz, they want every he want everything to be balanced. So, what is your point of view of the current situation? We have high technology, but our human have some kind of you know um, the attitude. The we have 
the but the human advancement itself is not come hide together with the scientific advancement. That's it. So what's your good. point of view? Very yeah. good observation, Prof. She can exactly. <laughs> I, and I and I understand. And you're not the only one to say say this. Many great philosophers in the modern period actually saw this problem. There is a great scientific technological advancement in the modern world, especially the last hundred years, but it is not commensurated with great uh, human development, whether intellectual yeah. or ethical, right? Uh, and and that's why, uh, and that's why Uncle Aziz, in fact, uh, yeah, basically he wants to produce balanced human beings that he hoped for at University of Malaya. That's why University of Malaya. Remember, he uh, at some point. He introduced uh, he, uh, this program, either program or courses on history and philosophy of science. Uh -huh. So basically, when you when you have some understanding of history and philosophy of science, you will understand that for 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 a thousand years, for example, like in other civilizations, like in the Muslim civilization, when you speak of scientific pursuits, it's never separated from human uh, sort of development, this ethics, this uh, adapt. This character. In fact, they see at, at for centuries, Muslims see their pursuit of science as a way to be closer to God, to be happier. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a change of perspective that Unkwazis, people like Unkwazis saw that has happened in modern times because we're just following the modern Western uh, perspective. So that's why, again, this one, this is why he talks about going back to the Asian learning tradition. Yeah, right. Mm, yeah. This one you can find a lot of answers here to your question in this article. The role of the university in Asia in twenty first century. I maybe Unkwazi Center of uh, Unkwazi Center can this. I mean, it can be a continuous series. There are many things that he said here needs to be analyzed further and unpacked and examined. Uh, maybe if those from we can collaborate with those in the education faculty, maybe with the educationist. Because there are many pertinent things still relevant. Because he's talking about what is the role of university in the 21st century. When yeah. when he wrote this was in the 94, 90s. <laughs> right? So yeah, there's a there's a huge problem, uh, Dr. Ashikin. And there are uh, and there are Muslim philosophers and uh, in fact Western philosophers who, who recognize this. So, but but the solution is uh, not so easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and for sure, the solution is not so easy. But it, but it's it's doable. It's possible because it's not like we don't know what the solution is. It's not like we don't know the way out. There are people, scholars, intellectuals, philosophers who have uh, showed us the way out, and that's why uh, that's why I that's part of the reason why I pursued my graduate studies at Arzia Al Kasis, which is uh, the Center for Advanced Studies on Islam, Science, and and Civilization. So that oh. we see these things is a complete whole again, not as a separate thing. Center for Advanced Studies on Islam, Science, and Civilization. A postgraduate school which tries to see all these things as an integrated whole, not as a separate thing. Oh, so yeah. this is based in University Technology in Malaysia. A very technologically bent university. <laughs> so we need more this kind of initiative. So, uh, you know, either you have such uh, initiatives in your own universities or you work with people who have that kind of expertise. That is the way forward, I would say. Allah. Allah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're getting we... we're getting more questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we getting. <laughs> maybe uh, I uh, uh, Abdul Rahman has uh, two questions, but maybe I uh, satukan. Uh, okay. So, uh, what strategies can governments implement to bridge the urban rural development divide to ensure that the marginalized or the vulnerable populations are not left behind? Okay, this is uh, again Abdul Rahman from Somalia, right? Yeah. Okay. Very good. I, I really appreciate your partic active participation, Mr. Abdul Rahman. You see, in the Muslim civilization, for centuries, we had an economic system which integrates not only the zakat system, but also we had awqaf, we had uh, sadaqah, we had infaq, we had uh, many things that, 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 that forms a complete system, right? And of course, it comes with a certain taxation system. It comes with a certain... Uh, uh, in fact, there is a cooperative model also. <laughs> but they don't use the term cooperative cooperative uh, in the Muslim civilization. There is a cooperative model. And it was practiced by Muslim institutions, Muslim educational institutions, 
Uh, so a lot of this, I think, is still remains relevant. This one I have not touched a great deal to, to show there are similarities between some of the solutions, economic solutions and economic institutions that of course is spoke about with how it's been practiced in the past. Because we have to consider in places like in Somalia, I'm, although now I recently I watched a documentary that uh, in Al Jazeera is booming. It's a booming economy now, it's, at least to some level in some places like Somalia. It's still a, there's still great a lot of work to 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 do for for them to overcome this uh, development challenge this, or, or or to to bridge the urban rural uh, divide. But I feel that you know that is why the Muslim civilization they had this model, and this is why remember there's one slide on Aziz is saying we should look into our history to 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 derive a certain model as well because these were very practical and it's been it's been practiced for centuries. <laughs> And it's more familiar to a Muslim majority place like Somalia, right? It's still a Muslim majority. So you talk, you use these words like zakat, infaq, wakaf. They may have heard, heard, heard it, at least they are elders, right? And, and because all that basically to make sure the wealthy reinvest or those with a more privilege will be reinvesting to those who are marginalized or vulnerable. That is the function of zakat, wakaf, in fact, sadaka, right? All this is meant to reinvest the surplus wealth from, from that society or from other surrounding societies to the marginalized and the vulnerable populations. That is basically what it is. I <laughs> uh, hope I answered that question. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are many more. Of course, there are many useful solutions and models uh, in the modern sense as well. But I feel that we shouldn't, simply forget yeah. this very <laughs> beneficial system and model from Muslim civilization, for instance. Okay. Yes, in fact, um, from a planning theorist, John Friedman, he mentioned that um, uh, the affordability or the income or uh, the categorization of poverty, it should also include um, the measurements of social power so it is not only income, but it is like the time, uh, for example, the times that the time that uh, you have to spend with your family, the time that you actually spend uh, uh, traveling, uh, your journey to work, and all that. So those those are also uh, uh, the the measurement of uh, uh, a person's um, uh, 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 monetary uh, power. They say. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, we have uh, one last question. Uh, this one, I, I got it from uh, the Q&A box. Uh, so according to uh, uh, the late Unku Aziz, uh, there was this one article from NST. So he mentioned that uh, uh, Unku Aziz is one of those distinguished economists who has never been entirely happy with economics as a discipline. Um, would you would you like to uh, um, elaborate on that? You, do, do you have any opinions on that? Yes, in fact, this article was written by me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's it. Yeah, I, I think I wrote it as a tribute to Professor Unko after his passing, uh, twenty twenty one. But this quote actually, uh, I found it by it is is uh, stated by a friend of Unko Aziz from Australia. The, I, I believe he has passed away. The Professor H W Ant. And I'm not sure whether he actually heard this from Uncle Aziz or this is his interpretation, but I can understand what he means by it. And and it, and it, you can tell it by the by the look of the writings <laughs> and and remarks of Uncle Aziz. He may not have criticizes uh, criticized or stated that he's not happy with economics per se. The fact that he goes beyond economics to address a range of issues shows that he's not limiting himself to, to as if all economics can have all the answers to a variety of social cultural problems, right? So that's number one. Number two is, um, I was gonna say, oh yeah, not many have known, but he's quite critical of certain prominent Western economists like John Kenneth Galbraith, you know, very prominent, I think Harvard professor economist. And he wrote like a, a a newspaper review or a critique of certain statements or a book by Professor John Kenneth Gaybreath in the NST. 
and I had I had that uh, uh, article that NSTPs that Ngozi's wrote criticizing. So I think he's uh, he's uh, he expresses his dissatisfaction with over reliance. I think with uh, uh, ec economics, and I think he's not the only one. In the West, also there are many learned economists. One of them, I think, that worth drawing your attention to is by the name of E. F. Schumacher. He was a student of that famous John Maynard Keynes, right? John Maynard Keynes was a well-known 20th century uh, economist of the West. And E.F. E. Schumacher was one of his students or prodigies. Uh, and I think after he was a student of Keynes at Oxford University and whatnot, and after E.F. Schumacher traveled broadly, he worked, I think he advised, he, he went to places like uh, Myanmar, right? He went to Southeast Asia. He started to 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 have uh, views. I think similar like Nkwazi's in the sense that he realized we need to refer to traditional wisdom, exactly like how I presented here, of the past, to have a more to meaningful uh, discussion and direction for economics. It needs to be anchored or rooted in this traditional wisdom. So at that point, at a certain point of his career, E.F. Yeah, Schumacher was advocating Buddhist economics. <laughs> Buddhist economics, interestingly. So, so yeah, so Nkwazis, I think, is one of those rare, uh, brilliant economists who, uh, who, who has a lot to say about <laughs> the field or discipline of modern economics as well. So I think that, that is the context, perhaps. Uh, for those who are interested. Hope that was useful. Right. Uh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Tashima, one more, one more, one more, last, last. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Since uh, from this present, from this discussion, it seems like uh, it's say it shown to us that uh, Professor Nkwazi is a very excellent person, so, uh, very excellent academy. Academia. So uh, I don't know either. Uh, maybe I just missed the uh, information at first. Uh, I, I, I would like to know uh, what were the early influence in Uncle Aziz's life that shaped his academic and professional pursuit. You know, uh, we were, we hope to have another person who will become the excellent. So we. I just want to know what influenced the professor Uncle Aziz. Uh, I can, uh, what what is the thing that influenced uh, Uncle Aziz's life that shaped it to become academic and professional person? Okay. So, the, Dr. Shikin, uh, for for more details, I will I will give my brief answer here. But for more details, please consult my book <laughs> because <laughs> because because yeah yeah. Well, from that from from your presentation, Dr. Shafi, I saw that uh, Professor Uncle Aziz loved to read. Yeah, that one. So I I just I just I just want to know your Okay. Your explanation a little bit. Yeah, for, sure, for the brief sure. one. No problem. Number one, to understand a person, you have to understand his entire upbringing. So that's what I did yeah. for my studies, for my research. Uh, but I'll go back not only to his parents, but I'll, go, I'll tell you something about his grandmother. Okay, grandmother. Okay. His grandmother, her name was Rogaya Hanum. She's not Malaysian. She's actually from the Turkish Ottoman Empire. She was sent by the Ottoman Sultan, the Turkish Ottoman Sultan, to marry a prince of Johor. That was Uncle Aziz's uh, grandfather. So his grandmother, Rokaya Hanum, she was trained by the, uh, the royal palace to, a very educated, to be a re very educated lady, right? Uh, Well-versed on cultural matters, on, on, I suppose, on intellectual matters also. She was sent by the Sultan of, of, of Ottoman Empire Turkey to marry this uh, this grandfather, great grandfather, uh, sorry, grandfather of Ngoazis. So, and his grandfather also, I think, was a learned man. And I think they have a child. And their child was uh, Ngoazis' father. Uh, Ngoazis' father was a learned man himself. He was among the early Malays to study at University of Cambridge. Although he studied at Cambridge University, Unko Aziz's father, Unko Abdul Hamid, Unko Abdul Hamid was also, he knew Sanskrit language. Sanskrit. He knows the ancient Egyptian chirograph, uh, uh, chirograph uh, sorry, the ancient Egyptian script, right? He knew uh, Persian. 
so this was Uncle Aziz's father. Uh, when he came back uh, from uh, England, Uncle Abdul Hamid, he served uh, in the uh, Johor Sultanate's uh, translation bureau. Uh, I meant to, and from what I gathered, uh, but he was his father was a learned man, but his, he didn't live long with his father. But father was ill, and I think uh, his father passed away when Uncle Aziz was about uh, seventeen or eighteen. But the father was also a righteous man. At first, he wasn't. <laughs> Uh, at first, he was just an average man. And then, towards uh, the end of his life, he was uh, uh, he was be he became a righteous uh, man. I think partly because the mother, uh, Gwazi's white mother, passed away very when he was a young boy. Gwazi's mother was uh, Armenian. We don't know much about her, but I managed to find a tribute about Gwazi's mother uh, at a mosque in the UK. Very, you know, because <laughs> that mosque still exists. So I managed to find out, and that mosque says something very beautiful about the mother. The mother was a selfless person. She was loved by everyone who knew her. A beautiful person, beautiful at heart. So you see that selfless trait of that mother was also in Uncle Aziz. You can, you can see it. He's so selfless, never thinks about himself, always thinks about others. That's number one. And I think that's, that's the spirit of him, of his intellect, of his reading not just for himself, but for him to pour that knowledge, that, that whatever that he learned, to, to serve the, the society, the people, and those who need. So that's his parents. And then the father, very interestingly, I think towards the end, uh, towards uh, when he was on his uh, dying, on his deathbed, when he was dying, he said, Uncle uh, Aziz, you know, don't worry, God will take care of you. But don't let go of your religion. Don't let go of your prayers. He said. And of course, this, you know, and he remembered this. It was recounted uh, in one one document. One 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 document. He remembered this. So the father also was well read, of course. So all that uh, that these are basic uh, the initial formative period that uh, shaped Gwazis's love for knowledge and learning and books. And then after that, when the father passed away, I think he was like, that's why his uncle, Dato On, took care of him, or was he was in the company of Dato On. Dato On also was a very learned man. You know Dato On? He translated uh, a famous book uh, called Thousand and One Nights. You know Thousand and One Nights? Alibaba, all this. <laughs> Sri Bisa uh, Malam. Kind of, much like, quite familiar. <laughs> yeah, Aladdin, Aladdin is from Thousand and One Nights. Thousand and One Nights, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, 1001 Nights is a famous literature book from, from the Arab world. Uh -huh. So, Dato On, Nkwazi's uncle, translated that book into Malay, into Jawi, I think. Uh -huh. So, he had that kind of family members who were, who were well read, you know, who, who love books and knowledge. And then, as he, uh, and then as, uh, as he grew old, uh, older, when he was in Japan, when he was in a very spiritual, he continues to, to read, to think. And to to you know uh, and to think of solutions on his own, independent mindedness. He you know he went to Japan and he read, but he's you know he read many things uh, about Islam, about uh, Russia, about China's philosophy. So he's not just limiting himself to just Western books. Mm. Very broad minded. That's why in uh, in nineties he very advocated that uh, what uh, that that the the our education system. Yeah, need to expose, uh, our, you know, uh, learners to appreciate great works of the past through time and across the globe, because that's what he did. <laughs> yeah, you see, uh, and then I think yeah, I, I think that, that that suffices for now because the the basic, uh, the basic uh, upbringing, basically. And also, he's exposed to not just any kind of books. Today, we like to, uh, like the tendency of our youth, I noticed they like to read popular books, right? There are many yeah. youth at the International KL International Book Fair, for instance, which is very good. But then they only read this, those popular books by popular writers. Yeah, and this, yeah. this is okay, but they should be exposed to the creative uh, works and discourses of mankind as well, the great works. So, so you see, because he appreciates top figures in the Muslim culture like Al-Ghazali, Rumi. And he read this when he was 60s because he confesses when he was younger, these things, he didn't have the patience to read it. 
But then he said, wow, these books are actually very profound. It talks about life and meaning of happiness, mm -hmm. which is very all very important. And imagine if if our youth, our universities also can give this kind of uh, exposure to our students, our youth, right? So I think uh, in the basic sense is that I, I feel it's more about his, yeah, his overall upbringing, the family, uh, and it's not necessarily the wealth in the family, the So mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean we are not, it doesn't mean if we're not privileged, that should restrict us because Nkwazi never really inherited all that wealth. He never sort of uh, take advantage of it. He deliberately sort of not, you know, that's why he led a sim simple life. I think his colleagues were saying that his office was very simple in University of Malaya. No, he doesn't change the furniture. And then by the time he left University of Malaya, still like that. Like that. And also, uh -huh. I think the sort of the, was it the uh, the net wealth? I don't know what's the term, net wealth of University of Malaya. They had a lot more money than when he started off. So he brought a lot of money <laughs> to University of Malaya because of his prudence uh, in his uh, spending. So he had discipline. He doesn't just talk about this. He led a very simple, a very simple life. He doesn't overspend. He's not, uh, what do you call it, uh, greedy. He doesn't have all these uh, negative economic traits. <laughs> uh, right? So, uh, yeah. I, so, in other words, yeah, I hope that gives you some taste, perhaps. Yeah, so. thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it is 12.18. Uh, is there last call for, wait, uh, in the chat there is, oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, last call for uh, any last questions? If not, uh, is, it, is it safe to say that uh, we, we are at the end, we have reached the end of our public lecture? Dr. Ashikin? Oh, yeah, uh, I think so. If there's no more question, it should be at the end uh, of our public lecture. So thank you. So it's okay, Dr. Norashima? Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you to Dr. Norashima and Dr. Muhammad Shafiq for very excellent and very insightful session. So we hope to see you guys again in future. And thank you to all the participants for being patient and stay focused and keep asking the question no matter what. Uh, along the public lectures, so please, uh, please forgive us for any weakness or anything that we should not be in the favor. So uh, we hope that that all the participants here will give us full support to the UAC by participate our next next and next public lecture till I don't know when. So your positive energy will give us a momentum to moving forward to work in combat the poverty in Malaysia. So. Before we end our session, I would like to ask every participant, could you please turn on the camera to take a group photo for this session for our record? So could everyone please turn on the camera? So who will do the count? Okay, who, who else not turn on the camera, please turn on. <laughs> we are waiting. So all this uh, e-certificate will be sent out by our team uh, after the end of the session. So maybe it will take a few days. So please check your email. So already? Not yet. Halida Kaunka? You count lah. You count lah. Eh, tak dengar, tak dengar. Volume tak ada. Tak ada. Tak ada, tak ada voice. Guna prof punya. Minta prof punya. Sorry, sorry. Hold on. Yes, get ready. Okay, get ready with your camera. Smile nicely for the photo. Okay. Okay, satu, dua, tiga. Yes, sekali lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Okay, thank you. Okay.
by the end of the photo session, uh, we go to the end of the population for today. Uh, very thankful to Dr. Muhammad Shafi and Dr. Nur Hashim Asim. So, yeah, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. See you. See you. See you. See you guys again. Uh, next time in the future. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.